You're listening to The Skeptic's Guide to the Universe, your escape to reality. Hello and welcome to The Skeptic's Guide to the Universe. Today is Wednesday, December 6th, 2023, and this is your host, Stephen Novella. Joining me this week are Bob Novella. Hey, everybody. Cara Santa Maria. Howdy. And Jay Novella. Hey, guys. Evan is out this week. As we said, Evan just had his surgery yesterday, and apparently everything went well. He is recovering. I can't wait to find out if he gets stronger. <laughs> he got stronger. <laughs> All right, Bob. It's pretty, that kind of blew my mind when he said, you know, that after they do the surgery, like because of mechanically what's changed that he actually might be a little stronger like that's that's remarkable. no it's not uh, it's not that he's going to be physically stronger it's that the connection of the ligament to the bone the mechanical will be advantage stronger. right he'll have more a more mechanical advantage no i just think it's going to be a tighter connection between yeah, the like ligament yeah like it's going to be less bone. likely to snap like it did this time yeah right which is a good thing well we got to ask him cuz i'm not 100% sure yeah, yeah if, don't, if don't listen to me what do i know but <laughs> Well, well, you're how, not a freaking surgeon, you know? I know, but how's it going to make his muscle stronger? It's just going to, the if connection... Anything, yeah, but the muscle, the pure muscle itself won't, you know, would, wouldn't be stronger. But if you... weaker. De, de, He's going to need depending on, Yeah, yeah, I'm just talking but, about, I'm just saying that muscle strength is, isn't purely dependent on the muscle. The, the attachment point also can confer a mechanical advantage, lower... You don't think that it's evolved or optimal mechanical advantage already? And you don't um, think that, like, I, muscle strength is n- not a significant difference, that, like, muscle strength overrides that, if that makes sense? Yeah. Like, even if somebody else had that mechanical advantage, would you even know? I because just think it's the, the connection is going to be stronger. That's Yeah, like... That's it. It's like, it's it's like under- saying, I got a fake knee. My knee is stronger because it's made of metal. Yeah. It's <laughs> like, titanium. of course it's stronger. I would think that if you moved it, it could potentially be stronger. If you go up the arm a little bit, you'll have a much, you'll have a better mechanical advantage. Maybe it's only five pounds stronger, but the mechanical advantage could be, could be attained. Yeah, Maybe but I don't just, think that's what everyone was saying. That's all right. What, well, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> You're just wishful thinking, Bob. You just want so to... basically, Evan is a cyborg. This is now. just, is that what just we're mechanics, man. Evan it's is mechanics. a cyborg. He is absolutely a cyborg. No question. That's cool. <laughs> uh, so, guys, I had another nature encounter in my yard today. Oh boy! It was just happened? this morning. So yeah, so we, my wife and I were, you know, basically eating breakfast downstairs in our kitchen, and right in our backyard, in broad daylight, this is the first time we saw a coyote. Oh, uh, oh really? Yeah. It's your first coyote? No, not my first coyote. First broad first daylight. Yard. Broad daylight uh, coyote. That's interesting because they're all broad daylight here in LA. Now usually like, they're very they're very nocturnal. And, uh, sometimes uh, crepuscular. Sometimes you'll see them at night when you're walking. But they've in LA they have adapted to be out during the day. They do uh, not. It's care. interesting. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. So what did he want, Steve? Well, he was food. definitely looking for food. I mean, he was sniffing all up and down our yard. So it's definitely the closest encounter I've had with a coyote. And again, first first broad daylight one. Our dog was inside at the time. And then I tried. To, I took. I got. I got like a crappy picture of him from through the window. Then I tried to sneak onto the deck to get a closer picture, and he ran off into the woods. Uh, and then we let our dog out, and he went. You know, our dog, who's a Australian Shepherd, just went crazy. Like he was like mm-hmm. sniffing up and down everywhere that the uh, the coyote was, like totally on patrol, like completely patrolling the edge of our property. <laughs> nice. Oh, he. I could de- definitely. I mean, all dogs I've had do that. I'm sure that that's a, just a common trait of dogs. But this dog, and I think it, my assumption is it because he's a, a shepherder, is that I mean, he is. He goes crazy when any predator comes anywhere near our property. Uh, you know what I mean? Like he definitely, I think, has an instinct to keep predators away from the area that he is protecting. Just like this is a level of behavior that's beyond any dog I've personally How cool had is that? Before. Yeah, Sweet it's cool. Boy. Very cool. Yeah, you think awesome. about like the achievement of selective breeding, being able to breed like straight up like protection behavior. Yeah, you know herding behavior like that. That's remarkable. Yeah, he, he definitely has the herding behavior that no other dog I've had before has. You know, he's, he's growing out of it a little bit, but like when he was younger, he would herd everything. You know, he would her- try to herd the car. You know, he would herd the vacuum. You know what I mean? Like anything that moved, <laughs> he just like he. His instincts would kick in and he would like, you could see that he's hurting it. It's just amazing. He still does it to me. Like when I'm getting the food, his food for dinner and he's hungry, he'll like nip at my heels. Like he's trying to control where I'm going Mm -hmm. to get his food. (laughs) Wow. Awesome. 
<laughs> and he can't help himself. When he when he nips my butt, what does that mean? I don't know. He nips your butt? Just a love bite. Yeah, he's probably trying to get you to go in a certain direction. <laughs> yeah, yeah, probably. Like a lot of herding dogs don't like it when the pack is separated. So mm-hmm. if like two people are in one room and one's in the other room and they're kind of wandering, they'll try and get you to go be with the other people. Because mm-hmm. they're used to herding sheep. Right. Or cows. Well, they're you know, not. Depending. But they're they're not used to herding sheep. Well, genetically that's what, they are. That's the interesting That's what I mean. That's yeah. that's the interesting part. Yeah. Like it's not like he's ever even seen a sheep. <laughs> right. But, yeah. But he's genetically imprinted to do all of yeah. these behaviors. You know, that's why like it's funny, but like when you most dogs, they have a purpose. Mm-hmm. The yeah, breed has a purpose. Too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Most you know, like, right, like, I don't know how many animals are out there that are, like, bred to hang out in your house. You know, like, they're, they're, most dogs are work dogs. Yeah. Like, and it's, it's interesting because all domesticates are like that, really. They're bred for a specific purpose. Some of them are behavioral. Some of them are more like just their body, you know, they're bred for food or something. But so, Steve, is this your first herding dog? Yeah. Yes. So I have friends who have, like, I have a lot of friends who have herding dogs. And um, a lot of their dogs are really, really really intelligent but also really really neurotic That's does him. your dog have any neuroses totally absolutely yeah yeah he's very smart and also very stubborn mm-hmm. and just has these weird neurotic behaviors that we are trying to figure out mm-hmm. like again over time he's getting better but like at the in the evening when we were calling him in for the last time because we're going to go to bed and he knows he always knows exactly what's happening right yeah and he's like he's sitting out in the front yard and I call him in. He just looks at me. He just sits there and looks at me. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, it, it, it's getting better. But it, I, to some extent, like, I have to go out at least a little bit, and then he'll come in. That's like, he, funny. He won't just answer the call. And we've read online that, yeah, that's the breed. The breed absolutely does that. So Except call, when my dog is in, over, Steve. When your dog you is over, you call my dog yeah, in, and, and then exactly he follows. Exactly right. Yeah, Jay, yeah, it's a little bit easier because, yeah, I just call Lando in and then. Sagan will follow. So, Steve, if you call Sagan in like mid afternoon, he'll just co- he'll just come in. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, I mean, you know, the dogs. They remember they're partly self domesticated, and a lot of their domestication is just being socially attuned to humans. And and of course, we get attuned to him. And I remember at one point, like you know, my wife is telling me all the things that she does to get him to come inside. I'm like, you realize that he's training you more than you're training him. Right, yeah. like he's totally. Like she's jumping through all these hoops to get him to do exactly, you know, what she wants him to do. But, and he's giggling inside. Uh, but like, if we're go- <laughs> if we're going to take him for a walk, like we just start getting ready to go for the walk, and he could be very subtle. He knows exactly what's happening. He knows we're about to take him on a walk, even if I'm just like changing my shoes or whatever. Like he knows that's what's happening, um, and then he gets all excited and everything. But. Yeah, I have a friend who's his dog. Her dog is especially smart, like probably one of the smartest dogs I've ever seen, but has so many weird things and learns associations really quickly. So like one time the dog was in bed and a firecracker went off. So now bed is danger Mm -hmm. and like will not get in bed again. And like Mm -hmm. now has to sleep in different places. So like really easy to associate things and really hard to disassociate them. So she just has to do a lot of training with this dog. But it's one of the best dogs I've ever seen. Like my dog was staying at her house and she put down food for my dog. And her dog went up to eat it. And she was like, not for you. One time. Dog never came back to my dog's bowl. And I was Mm -hmm. like, I could never teach my dog to do that. Yeah. He'd be like, that is food on the floor. It is for me. Clearly, <laughs> no. He's he's well disciplined in that way too. We had mm-hmm. our previous dog. Yeah, my previous dog was a gold retriever. He's very sweet, but a total goofball and pretty much untrainable. I mean, not yeah. you know, you know how trained him <laughs> and everything, but like in terms of like inhibiting his own like behavior, forget about it. There's this wonderful video we saw on YouTube where they show it's like a dog contest, and they, they, one of the things was the dog walking down a, the long aisle of distractions, right? And, mm. and the, like, like there's food and a toy and whatever, and they have to ignore all of that and go from one end to the other. And then they show like a golden retriever doing it. And he went for every single distraction, it was completely undisciplined, just <laughs> I'm like, that's, that's, that's my dog. That is completely But the funny dog. thing is a lot of labs and golden retrievers are very trained. Like, you know, they're often used for um... – for helping dogs, like service dogs. Yeah. Oh, yeah. He was and very so, but, smart. Yeah. And I said we could, we could train him, but but inhibiting <laughs> his behavior in that way, no. But my my you know Australian Shepherd you know dog, my current dog, is very disciplined. You know, once you get him to do what you want to do, like we have an invisible fence, 
like almost instantly trained him. Like he just one time we had to tell him, like, yeah, you, this is the limit. Like, don't go beyond this limit. I don't think he even ever had to get shocked. And he like completely knows how to, to stay within the limit. In fact, you know, when we take him for walks, like again, he has this weird behavior and we have to figure out what's going on in his head. Like, why is he doing what he's doing? And one of the things we figured out is that if he gets to any barrier that reminds him of the edge of our property, oh, yeah, he won't sense. go near it. He won't yeah. go near it. But but it's weird, like, which barriers trigger that for him and which ones don't. Because uh, we live in a cul-de-sac, so every time we get to a cul-de-sac, like, he gets scared and won't go any for, beyond a certain... Yeah, I can relate point. to that. Uh, Jay and I talk about it a lot. It's like we're we're like, you know, what's happening in Steve's head? What is he? <laughs> why is he doing what he's doing? You know, it's like, come on, it's unfathomable. Ooh, you should. I'd be curious. So, so my friend who has this super smart dog, she and she's really interested in dog training and stuff. So they have a lot of fun together. She taught him. He knows about. I, oh gosh, I'm probably misspeaking here. Ten of his toys by name. Mm-hmm. So she can say, "Go get the axolotl." Or like, go get the whale, and he'll run into the other room and retrieve the correct toy. That's awesome. Yeah, that is awesome. It's really cool. Yeah. Like, you could probably do some pretty cool experiments with your dog. Mm-hmm. I, I've i seen the champ at that test, and he actually was able, his record was something crazy, like, yeah, it was like 150. Yeah, it was a lot. It was, it was crazy. It was that like, research dog, I remember. Oh, my God. Uh-huh. It was very cool. Yeah, they were high in neuronal density. My dog is by far... The best dog I've ever met in my life. He's a gem. <laughs> he is a gem. Yeah, he's a sweetheart. Totally I say desperate the same thing for attention. Killer. Yeah. <laughs> Although Jay, your dog, man, we we still haven't been able to train him to go for a walk properly. <laughs> he constantly wants to pull on the leash, and haven't been able to break him of that. But again, we only get him for a few days at a time. You know what I mean? We haven't been able to do it consistently. Yeah, yeah I mean, we, I hike like, with him, and he, you know, I can get him. Like, a, he he needs like ten minutes to be excited, and yeah. then he chills out and he 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 slacks on the leash. Leash, but yeah, I know exactly what you're saying, and he's yeah. super strong. Like, super he's got strong. a very powerful body. You know, yeah, it's a totally different workout when you're walking with him. All right, guys, let's go on with the show. Bob, you're going to start us off with a quickie. Sure, thank you, Steve. This is your quickie with Bob. Ceramics in the news this week, but this this ceramic is laser etched with data that the startup company Cerabyte claims is ideal for long term cold storage. It's fast and dense and inexpensive and rugged all at the same time, which is saying something. Guys, they say this tech could make ten thousand terabyte palm sized cartridges that last for five thousand years. Is that all five thousand. They even launched a demo of a fully operational prototype system. The tech is cool. The cartridge contains a layer of tough glass, similar to Gorilla Glass, and thin layers of ceramic, 50 to 100 atoms thick. The data is then etched, get this, 2 million femtosecond laser beamlets that creates a pat- patterns in the ceramic, not unlike a QR code. Their initial product in 2024, I mean, just you know, a few a month or so from now should have a 10 petabyte capacity followed by the next gen, which would be 100 petabytes. And then they say uh, in the next decade, they plan on using particle beams to etch the data, potentially reaching a terabyte or more per square millimeter. Incredible density there. Similarly, they, their transfer speeds are expected to improve from the gigabit per second range to terabit per second range using that particle beam. So uh, amazing archival storage if this really, really does pan out. And we all know that data stored on tapes, hard drives, disks, et cetera, they're at serious risk. Once you get to, what, five years, 10 years, by then, you're, if you haven't looked at it in 10 years, you're pretty much guaranteed there's going to be some serious data drop out. Longer than that, I mean, you got to be you got to be redoing your storage on archive. Uh, I mean, you should be doing it sooner than five years. So, if this is true, five thousand years. I mean, ceramic is amazing. They were inspired by ceramic artifacts that have retained uh, micro scale um, marks on them, like fingerprints, for for thousands of years. So, um, it, it is an amazing an, an amazing medium. So, we'll see if anything uh, pans out. This has been your quickie with Bob. Back to you, Steve. So, Bob, these are not rewritable, right? This is just they, right. they etch it once and that's it. Yeah. yeah. So this would that's, be for yeah. archiving or backup or... Exactly. Archival, long-term, cold storage of data. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's, you know, they say 5,000 years, um, which is, you know, pretty ridiculous. I mean, if it lasts, just imagine just a generation, 
20, 30, 40 years, which it, which it should. I mean, the ceramic is designed to last. So uh, I, hope, I hope it pans out. Bob, like, to ha- how do you actually read it, though? Like, you have to have a special reader? Or, sure. You know? Yeah, it's got these uh, micro-optical readers to, to read it. Uh, but they can apparently do it pretty fast as well. That's what that's what they're claiming. So they're they're a prototype. They're they're fully operational prototype. Like I said, it was supposedly fully operational, but it doesn't. It didn't have the it didn't have the maximum density that they say their first generation, the ten petabyte uh, first gen, will have in uh, later this you know late in twenty twenty four sometime. So, so it's like the death Cerabyte. Keep an eye on the company. C E R A B Y T E. Hmm. All right. Thanks, Bob. So Bob, I was a little surprised you didn't choose to do this oh, news man. item this week. Uh, Almost. I came so close. I was going to do it next week. But I'm sure you'll have some some stuff to add. So you guys are familiar with the probably the the biggest scientific question, at least in the world of physics, which is how do we unite quantum mechanics and general relativity? Right. Mm -hmm. So we have quantum mechanics, which deals with the world of the very tiny atomic, subatomic and essentially you know, t- t- it tells us that the world at that scale is quantized, like there are quanta of energy, there are, you know, things that you can't get get smaller than, and that the the universe is probabilistic at that level, right? Like, there aren't particles, there are waves, and there are probability waves, etc. That's the, that's the world of quantum mechanics. Right, then that's there's, what Einstein hated. God, the yeah. famous quote, God doesn't throw dice. He hated that, and he was wrong. And then there's general relativity, which deals with the super big scale of the universe, and that's uh, to, you know that deals with space time. And essentially, the big uh, concept there is that gravity is a function of curved space time, uh, right? Like I can't remember who said this, but I might remember that yeah. matter tells space time how to curve, and space time tells matter how to move. So. Like if right. the the Earth is going around the Sun, the Earth is actually traveling in a straight line, but it's going in a straight line through curved space, and that curved space takes it, you know, a path, is a path that that is the orbit of the Earth around the Sun, right? Right. So one of the Steve, one of the ways to distinguish quantum mechanics from general relativity is that uh, the wave equations um, in, in quantum mechanics are defined on a fixed space time, whereas general relativity says that space time is dynamic. So that's one of mm-hmm. these these headbutting areas that why they, it's so hard to join these two together. That's right. And just um, mathematically, the equations don't match. And so what that means is that if we ever have a situation where relativistic effects and quantum effects are both significant, we can't resolve that. So for example, you know, within a black hole, for example, right, where you might have both relativistic and quantum effects at the same time. We don't know how to deal with that because we need a theory of quantum gravity and we don't have one. Uh, Jay, do you know offhand what the two leading theories of how to unite quantum mechanics and gravity, general relativity are? Yeah, I mean, someone just needs to take them to a bar and let them talk it out. You yeah. know? <laughs> how about you, Kara? Mm. <laughs> so have you heard of string theory? Mm-hmm. Of course. Yep, so that's one, right? So string theory on one level is an attempt at, at uniting quantum mechanics and general relativity. And string theory says that at, at its most fundamental level, particles are actually little vibrating strings. And that those Vibrating strings are what are the like the most fundamental building block of stuff. But Steve, is that a way to visualize it, or is that like what's a mathematical really construct? Right, it's, it's just okay. it's a mathematical. It's the it's math, and as and we've had this discussion, I think you know, with Brian and other physicists on the show, saying like, does the string theory is it testable? Does it say anything about the the way the universe actually works? It's like, well, it has some utility. You know, as a theory, it does help you do the math to work out some things about reality. That's not the same thing as as testing it to see whether or not it's actually a true description of reality. The other competing theory, which I don't think gets as much play in the, no, it doesn't. In the press, in the popular media, is loop quantum gravity. And loop quantum gravity says uh, it basically treats space-time at the quantum scale as tiny loops. Right. Well, string theory deals with point particles as if they were strings. So is, is reality loopy or stringy? That's what it comes down to. It's fieldy. So now, for the first time since I, since I can remember, right, the first time we have a third competitor in this field trying oh, to cool. unite these two. And this is called post-quantum theory of classical gravity. 
there were two papers recently published going over this idea. And the idea here is that in trying to unite space-time and quantum mechanics, that space-time, we can actually treat space-time and gravity as if they are classical, meaning that they're not quantized as you would, they would need to be in order to mesh with quantum mechanics. So, but rather than trying to quantize gravity, this theory, the post-quantum theory of classical gravity, states it tries to unite the two by modifying quantum mechanics. And here's a quote now. The theory modifies quantum theory and predicts an intrinsic breakdown in predictability that is mediated by space-time itself. So what this deals with is the fact that at the quantum level, there is a certain unpredictability to reality. You guys are familiar with that concept. And that yeah. there's like this boiling ocean of quantum foam, you know, that of unpredictability that exists in, to reality itself. To the fact that if you tried to measure the, the, a mass, like if you had an unchanging mass, it actually would be variable. It would be fluctuating at the quantum level. But you would need to measure that mass really precisely, you know, like orders of magnitude more precisely than we currently can in order to detect that the quantum fluctuations in the mass of that object, right? Now, what the this new theory, this post-quantum theory states is that that variability is increased, right? It's greater than it would be with either loop quantum gravity or string theory. And so what that means, something very important, that means that this theory is testable, right? It's possible yeah. to conduct an experiment that rules it out. And that experiment, you know, there's two experiments that they present in the papers. One experiment is the fluctuation experiment, basically measuring just more precisely than we ever currently have the fluctuation in a physical property like the, the mass of a fixed object. If they are smaller than a certain size, if the fluctuations are small, that rules out the post-quantum theory. If they're bigger than a certain amount, they argue, that rules out both loop quantum gravity and string theory. And so if we can see a way to conduct this experiment, we actually we won't give us what the answer is, but at least enable us to rule out some of these theories. The other way to test the theory is to determine how long particles can be in a superposition. So you know how you know, a particle could be both a wave and a particle at the same time, right? Or it could be, you know, in a superposition of multiple states. And the bigger the object, the smaller the amount of time it could remain in the superposition. So one way to think about quantum mechanics is that it exists at every scale, like quantum effects exist. We are quantum creatures. It's just that the quantum effects at our, at macroscopic scales are unmeasurable. They're just... They're like way down. You're getting close to the Planck length. You know, they're very, very, very tiny. So it, what they're saying here is that if you measure the sort of quantum effects of particles, of this basically superposition, the this uh, post-quantum theory predicts that a large particle, you know, when I say large, I'm not talking macroscopic. I'm talking about like a large molecule versus just an atom or a subatomic particle. A, a large molecule would would be able to remain in a in superposition for longer than under loop quantum gravity or string theory. Was that your understanding of it as well, Bob? Because again, we're but we're trying to you know to decipher a pretty technical paper. Yeah, my for me the the biggest sticking point was this probabilistic mechanism and, and how that yeah. works. So so let me let me just give a quick. A quick overview that it, from another angle, because you, as you know, Steve, there's a million different ways that this can be described. Yeah. And sometimes you hit upon a description that makes it gel in your head. So for a quick, just a, just a, a basic overview, the loop quantum gravity and string theory, they tried to quantize gravity. The, mm -hmm. This new idea, this new theory 
leaves gravity as a classical theory, does not quantize gravity, and it couples it to quantum theory through this whole idea of this probabilistic mechanism. So what that means is that the evolution of, of space and time itself has these probabilistic elements embedded in it that you, so that you can't do anything about. They will always be probabilistic, and you won't be able to make unique predictions about future states. That's what it means. And one of the, ch- one of the challenges of this, though, is that there, there, some things change. Like we have a loss of quantum information in a black hole in this theory, which a lot of, a lot of astrophysicists are going to be like, whoa, lost of quantum information is lost. That's not supposed to be that way. So this is going to, that's a challenge that they're going to have to deal with. Yeah. But it does, you know, they did get rid of a lot of the problems that this, that this approach had. And so, so that's an interesting thing. But as you said, Steve, the most important takeaway here is that we have serious tests, which have been lacking for other, all these other theories. And hopefully soon, 10, 20 years, you know, hopefully sooner, They'll be able to do a serious test, not to prove really one or the other, but to essentially rule out one or the other. So that would be um, an amazing step right there, to, even if it's just ruling out something. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, you know, the, the authors uh, in, in an interview said they think it'll take 20 years to yeah, conduct 20. these experiments, which to me always means, like I always just double it in my head. It's like, okay, that means 30, 40 years. We'll probably have the results of these experiments. But, but yeah, but it's decades. Yeah. It's not going to be something that we're going to, no, in a year or two, it's going to take a long time to get to the point where we can test it. And you know, like there are, we've spoken about, like with the Higgs boson, where like somebody comes up with an idea, and then it's fifty years later before we do the definitive test yeah. and know if it exists or not. So again, that kind of thing w- would not surprise me. But this is, you know, this really is a very, very tough problem to hack. This is a generational physics problem, really. This idea of uniting quantum mechanics and, and, and general relativity. And it's important because it really is a sticking point in trying to you know, go forward here. And there are, we, we come up with questions all the time, like, uh, is artificial gravity possible? It's like, well, probably not, but we won't know for sure until we have a theory of quantum gravity. You know what and I mean? how about this, Steve? The same, I've, I've read the same in terms of addressing, can we travel into the past? Uh, you know, the answer is typically probably not, almost definitely not, but we won't know for sure until we develop quantum <laughs> gravity. Like, gravity, okay. Right. right. It leaves the door cracked open a little bit, depending a on- crack, how, A crack, tiny crack. A crack, yeah, yeah, yeah. But how amazing would it be if the when we do come up with a theory of quantum gravity, it, that, that door is cracked open? If we develop anti-gravity, that means we can build the Millennium Falcon. That's right. Anti-gravity well, is a game changer, right? Like yeah. when we wrote our you know, futurism book, we basically had to say like there's one future with anti-gravity and there's another future without anti-gravity. And they're very, very different in terms of yeah. super advanced technology. And most of science fiction behaves as if anti-gravity is possible, but in reality, it probably isn't, which means space travel is always going to suck, and it's always going to be difficult getting off of planets, like getting out of gravity wells, and there never will be anything like the Millennium Falcon. That's probably the, the actual future that will exist. You know, that's the reality. Um, but uh, yeah, it would be certainly would be awfully nice if we could just float off into space. Yeah. Well, I, I'll, I'll put my dime down right now. Any gravity is not going to happen. Yeah. Gra- I, I agree. It's just gravity by its very definition is dynamic. Therefore, you won't be able to have an anti gravity anything. It's just not going to happen. Uh, the only the only tiniest hope we had was if that antimatter fell up. Yeah. That didn't happen. It so, didn't I mean, happen. it's just like that's not – that's the biggest hand wavium bit of sci-fi out there. It's, it's, a, <laughs> it's a top top five. No, top it's true. Three. It's for that one thing completely changes almost every bit of science fiction about the future. Right, about the yeah, far yeah, future. Totally yeah, right. you know, I'm okay. You know, throw your gravity plating in your ship, I guess, you know. Uh, <laughs> but it's just don't – I'm not, you know – I'm not looking forward to it. Right. <laughs> All right, Jay, tell us about this new X Prize for HealthSpan. Yeah, like if this works out, Steve, then we might be around long enough to <laughs> see anti gravity. <laughs> yeah, you guys have heard the about the X Prize. Bob and I are big fans of it. I keep referring back to um the X Prize that they did where they awarding really big money prizes to companies that, that develop some type of self driving car. You know, this was the beginning of that whole all of that technology. So X, the X Prize Foundation um, does a really good job at inspiring companies to try to reach technological goals by awarding them huge amounts of money if they can if they can actually you know get to a certain bar. 
So in this instance, this is a pretty uh, groundbreak, groundbreaking competition um, that they came up with. It's called X Prize Health Span. So X Prize will be awarding 101 million U.S. dollars. That those that's the total purse. Um, two organizations who whose researchers are working on, you know, drugs and other therapies and lifestyle strategies that would rejuvenate human biology. Specifically, they want methods that will extend, you know, how long a person can live in a biologically healthy state, something they're, they're calling a person's health span. This is going to be a yeah. word um, that if you haven't heard of yet, you'll, you know, you'll, it'll, you'll start hearing it. It's going to be used more and more. So yeah, the nobody, health span, want, nobody wants to be old and decrepit at 120. They want to make, you know, they want to make you be healthy from 80 to 90, 80 to 100 or whatever, where you're healthy and active. And then you have a very short period of decline and die and not have decades of decline and decrepitude. Absolutely. Yeah. Goal. So, you know, the, at its core, it means a life free of disease and disability until the bitter end, right? So right at the end. So applicants the heat, the have death. to show... Applicants have to show research that targets restoring muscle and cognition and restores immune system function of, of elderly individuals to essentially a more youthful state. The competition is sponsored primarily by a guy called Chip Wilson. He's the founder of Lululemon and Athletica. These are two clothing brands, by the way. It's also sponsored by an organization called Evolution Foundation. And this is this is pretty cool. I, I just found out about this foundation. The Evolution Foundation is an organization that, that at its core, it funds research that specifically targets health span. They give money to companies to, uh, to further their research and development on lots of different things, but they're all surrounded, you know, they're all about the concept of health span. So breakthroughs in this area could significantly improve the quality of life, for aging individuals, but also help prevent chronic diseases that are closely associated with aging. Healthcare systems worldwide are facing, you know, a, a horribly important milestone, which is there's a, there's a, an older population, and the older population needs special care and you know more you know more procedures and medicine and everything. And and as those numbers go up. Um, there aren't enough people in the healthcare industry to support the amount of old people that are exist now and that will exist in the next 10, 20, and 30 years. And you know, the numbers are going to keep going up from where they are today. Won't so, make the problem worse if people are living longer? Well, I think from what Bob was saying, like people will live – it's not about life extension. It's about improving your health span, which is improving the quality of your life that you have. But do, do, do they really distinguish those two things or they, do they want both? I mean, I, from my read, Steve, it's more about the quality of life that you have, and not about. But what does what does the the X Prize say? Like, what what does it actually say? Can you tell us? So, what the X Prize is saying is they're they're talking specifically about health span, right? And health span, mm -hmm. if you read it and read the definition of it, at its core, it's it's improving quality of life while you're alive. It really isn't. It isn't about like, hey, let's add 30 years to the yeah. human lifespan. It's let's improve the quality of life at, in the last 20 to 30 years. But then my question is, how are they going to how are they going to quantify that? Exactly. And well, let me tell you. I can get. I have more information for you. So the competition right now is structured to award varying prize amounts, and those prize amounts depend on the achievements that the research teams get to. So the largest prize, 81 million dollars. This will go. To uh, you know, one of the research teams that can compensate for age-related declines in muscle use and cognitive abilities and immunity by 20 years. So to clarify, because it was a little unclear, they're saying that they oh, want yeah. to be able to essentially make people like, let's say you, you give people these treatments and they're 60 years old, they want their their physicality to be closer to a 40 year old, mm -hmm. and then. It goes down from there. So if they can do a 15-year improvement, that'll be 71 million. If they could do a 10-year improvement, that'll be 61 million. So the X Prize Health Span Initiative follows a series of aging research competitions. That, now this includes the Methuselah Foundation's M Prize. Um, this is for therapies extending the lifespan in mice. We also have the National Academy of Medicine, which has it's it's it. Um, providing catalyst awards since 2019 and this totaled about 30 million globally for advances in health aging research. So researchers entering the competition uh the new competition will need to submit information about their existing 
research, and this is going to include things like uh, data from cell and animal and human studies, and those whose uh, submissions meet the X Prize's criteria for safety, feasibility, and effectiveness, they will be selected as semifinalists, and they will move on to the clinical trials that are going to start. They're saying now it'll start in 2026. Now, there are some critics of this X Prize, and they're saying, and these are scientists, and they're saying that they've raised concerns um, about this one-year timeline for the clinical trials um, and I agree with them. They're saying that the time frame could be too short to prove a long-term effect necessary necessary for like a drug approval, as an example, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. Well, not just that. How do you know how it's going to affect aging if you don't give people time to age? Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, I think because they're going to be looking at it in multiple different ways that they can extrapolate. Uh, but I agree, Kara. Like, I'm not cl- it's not clear from what I read. You know, what they're saying is not perfectly clear. But you got to keep in mind, you know, I, I don't disagree with the critics and there's always critics and we should always be mindful of looking at it from the other side and, and trying to shoot holes in it. But at its core, the X Prize is trying to deliver money to companies and organizations and research facilities to help inspire new technology, make make you know quicker advancements. Um, that's the whole point. And that's what they're doing. It just happens to be, you know, a health related one this time. So I'm all for it. Um, I, I really hope that they fashion it, you know, in the, the best way that it can for the time frames that they have. But I'm I'm kind of excited about it too, because you know we're gonna, you know, when this happens, companies jump in and they they you know other other investors invest in those companies so they can get to the prize, and it usually ends up creating new technologies that advance humanity. So I'm I am all for uh, the efforts of the of X Prize, and I'll be definitely following this one. Yeah, Matt, just from a purely money, you know, money savings point of view, imagine if they're even partially successful. Um, imagine, you know, what they could save in healthcare costs. It, 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 like in the billions or more. It, it's really – Oh, yeah. Just, for just, sure. But, that, but it's just, not organized specifically to accomplish that. That You're just hoping that's going to be a side effect. Yeah, that's – like that's the thing that bugs me about this kind of approach is like I do like it when there's more – um, incentivization for innovation like this, but it's not like people aren't already doing this. Yeah, was, it's not like this is the first time people thought, "Oh, increase health years or whatever." They're every every biomedical approach is keeping that in mind. Oh well, Kara, let me well, this let is me clarify. Being incentivized though, I mean, you said yeah, that exactly. Was good. It's an incentivization. Yeah, these aren't new companies that are applying. Like all of the research facilities and companies and organizations that would apply for this. They have to have already they're, – they're already in the research right, thing. They're okay. already doing it. Like they're going to be submitting their research to the X Prize, and then the X Prize is going to pick the ones that they feel that, that have the most uh, possibility. Right. But this isn't like you know new companies going, hey, we're going to all of a sudden start a company to do, to do this. Like, right. They've been doing this. Yeah. They're just taking the best ones. They're p- running them through a series of tests to really figure out which are the which are the best of the best here. And then they're essentially saying, we're going to give you money if you can get to these benchmarks, which right. is really – it is. It's just incentivizing them to, to get to those benchmarks faster than they may have normally done on their own. It's yeah, funny because even sense. though we're talking millions of dollars, if they really did make a serious breakthrough, uh, the, the money that they could potentially – Get yeah. from that would be far in you know far exceed even the, the millions that they would get. That's from the thing. There kind of this. already is an incentive structure built in here, you mm-hmm. know, right? Uh, in that, if you do have an innovation, especially like if it's a drug, it could be a billion dollar drug. Yeah, uh, you know, the hundred million dollars is is you know not a significant addition to that, and probably mm-hmm. the research you'd have to fund in order to win the prize is going to be more than that. It's, that it's not... I agree with. The research you'd have to fund outstrips it, but I disagree that our incentive... You're right in the long term we have that incentivization structure, but we know that capitalism isn't built for the long term. Short term. Yeah. It's short it's term. Short yeah, term. yeah listen, so I'm, having, I'm... having bragging rights and a little bit of extra, yeah. like, ooh, we are X prize winners, maybe then a, a pharma company would say, okay, we can actually in, invest mm-hmm. in this division that we've not really been investing in before. Yeah, I see that. I mean, I'm always a little hesitant about things like this. I'm a fan of the X Prize in general, 
And I think they work best when they are basically incentivizing kickstarting a new technology like they did that with self-driving cars, you know, and that probably accelerated the development of self-driving technology by a decade, you know, because of the X Prize, right? So th that kind of thing is great. And here, I'm just not sure that their goal is properly focused or optimally focused. I'm still left wondering, like, what exactly are they going to be researching? And if the goal is to is to save healthcare dollars, you could frame the 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 incentive or the research more of developing interventions that save healthcare dollars, right? Like that's the that is the right. outcome measure you are using. Like you're going to replace a super expensive tech. Uh, uh, process or treatment or whatever with something that costs an order of magnitude less. And, and which is, I think would be a great idea because right now that's not how our research is incentivized. Our research is largely incentivized for expensive treatments with incremental improvements. Not that right. this, the incremental improvements aren't great, but we do, I do. And, and you do have to think of cost effectiveness and there is like on grants and everything they are getting, they are looking at that more, but still like there are, I think there are times where, you know, like we could be doing research in order to develop a treatment that's no better than existing treatments in terms of outcomes, but that just costs a lot less. And I don't really see a lot of that happening. And I think we're underestimating how important that is because we already basically can't afford to pay for health care. And so if we give ourselves even more expensive health care that we can't afford, what are we really buying? And I, I, I don't think we're, we've balanced it well, our research priorities well enough to also emphasize cost effectiveness and it's biting us in the ass. You know what I mean? But we, that's we, why something like this, I think, is a little bit, I don't want to call it fringe, but it's a little bit, it's like additive because it's yeah. sexy. They want something yeah. sexy and what you're talking about isn't sexy. No, I know it isn't. It's maximally not sexy, mm -hmm. which is why it doesn't get done. But it is, mm -hmm. but it is super, super important. Like I spoke about, you know, previously not too long ago about the monoclonal antibodies, which are awesome. I, I prescribe them all the time. But I'm like, oh, great. So now we have a technology where we just have really expensive drugs. Yes, they're effective. But right. now it's but like, does now that really I, mean anything if nobody yeah. can use them? Well, it's, it is like now, okay, oh, great. Now I can prescribe a drug for, for migraine patients that cost $6,000 a year, you know, instead of the $100 a year drugs. <laughs> yeah. That's great, you know, and, I'm, and when, I, when you need it, you need it, and it's awesome. And it can be cost-effective in, in certain patients. Like if they're winding up in the ER once a month, it's very cost-effective. But believe me, a lot of people are getting it, you know, where it's, it's not cost-effective, but it is clinically effective. So... If we're not balancing those two things, we we just basically end up with a with either you're lived in a, live in a country with nationalized healthcare, they're going to ration it, they're just not going to pay for it. You live in a country like the United States, insurance companies are going to totally clamp down on it and raise all kinds of uh, barriers to prescribing it, and uh, and the healthcare costs you know go up as they have been. So or you have a hybrid model where. Yeah. It's a hybrid. There's nationalized health care healthcare where yes, some things have to be rationed, but then you have a free market, but that free market is competing with a national service, which is keeping prices low. Yeah, it's complicated. It is all complicated. And you yeah. know, again, I hope something good comes out of this. You know, I hope, you know, if you but again, I I'm still not clear on exactly what they're gonna be doing. So it's like one of their outcomes is you'll get your immune system to function like a 40-year-old when you're 60. Like, how, how do you exactly measure that? are you going to be measuring that? Right. And, and what's the clinical outcome of that? And, you know, I, so it's, I think it's just for, for an X prize, it's all a bit fuzzy to me. But we'll right. see how it goes. Well, everyone, we're going to take a quick break from our show to talk about one of our sponsors this week, Aura Frames. You know, you spend hundreds of dollars on a phone with a really good camera. You take thousands, if you're like me, tens of thousands of photos, and then you just never even look at them again. But Aura can help you see all of those photos and videos, and it is a great holiday present. Yeah, at this point, I mean, I think everybody in my family has one, right? Because we, we've been giving them away 
as gifts. Uh, guys, this is freaking awesome. It's just a great – it's a great present, especially for like people with kids and family members. Like they can see pictures rotating all the time and the video quality is wonderful. And it's very easy to add photos to the whole thing. It's a great gift. Visit AuraFrames.com slash skeptics today and get $30 off their best-selling frames. These frames sell out quickly though, so get yours before they're gone. That's A-U-R-A frames.com slash skeptics. Use promo code skeptics to get $30 off their best-selling frame. Terms and conditions apply. All right, guys, let's get back to the show. All right, Kara. Yes. Tell us about electroconvulsive therapy. So you may or may not have heard of electroconvulsive therapy, also known as ECT. Historically, you probably heard the other name that people used, which was electroshock therapy. And to be fair... Electroshock therapy historically is relatively different from what we now call electroconvulsive therapy, but they are kind of based on the same principles. You know, as somebody who works in psychology, I have patients who have had ECT. I have patients who have refused ECT and everything in between. Looking at the literature about ECT, it's really interesting. This is sort of to to prime the story here. We know that ECT works. We know it's effective. We know that patients who undergo electroconvulsive therapy, most of them feel better. Their depression symptoms are lessened, and they're lessened significantly. We're talking somewhere in the kind of in the area of like 80% of patients who undergo this treatment, and usually they get this for what we call treatment-resistant depression. So they've tried a few different drugs, and they haven't had the relief that they are hoping for. We know that they, uh, about 80% of patients who undergo this get up to 50% reduction in depressive symptoms. And for anybody listening who has ever huh. dealt with you know, clinical depression, a 50% reduction in depressive symptoms could be the difference between like suicidality and functionality. Like that's, well, that's a lot. That's big. That's huge. It's yeah. Huge. I, w- I would even exaggerate that a little bit, like by saying, you know, a 50% improvement could be the difference between, you know, actually living a life that you do find enjoyment in, you know, like mm-hmm. yeah. if the dep- depression goes down that much, you could, you, you, it sounds to me like you'd be having some good days in the mix, you know? But mm-hmm. it's also, Jay, it's basically, and this is how it's mainly used. It's the difference between functioning and not functioning. Yeah, uh, 100%. Like being in bed, unfunctional versus getting out there and going to work and t- raising your kids or whatever. Yeah, absolutely. This is really, really significant for a lot of people, yet it's just not commonly utilized. And so, you know, the researchers in this um, new study were interested in a couple of things. They were interested first in kind of discussing why it is that we don't utilize it much, even though it's we know it works, but B, like getting past that, what actually happens in ECT? And so, you know, the question of why we don't utilize it much, it probably is like deeply related to stigma. I think that there are a lot of like media representations of ECT. One floor of the cuckoo's nest. Yeah. One floor of the cuckoo's nest where they make it look like a lobotomy. Like they really don't represent, and they show it as punitive and they really don't represent it as a success story. Um, and they don't – I'm thinking of like um, Requiem for a Dream, the Aronofsky film, when Ellen Bernstein's character gets ECT and she's awake while she's getting it, which is not how it's done. So just the the actual representation I think is quite stigmatizing. But beyond that – how does it work? It's so funny. So so leading up to do this news item, I was talking to my friend on the phone. Well, as I told you, I was like listening to the article and I was driving. I was stuck in a lot of LA traffic today. And, and she was like, what are you going to talk about? And I was like, ECT. And she was like, how does ECT work? And I was like, well, it's interesting because it like sort of imagine like a seizure, right? Which is a bunch of neural activity all at once, sort of all happening at the same time, which is really, really dangerous. It can be damaging to your brain tissue. But when done in a controlled way, sort of resets these synapses, right? Like all these things are firing at the same time. They're not used to doing that. So it sort of resets. And she's like, how? And I'm like, I don't know. (laughs) And it was so funny because I started thinking deeply about it. And I was like, I feel like I know this stuff, but I don't really know this stuff. So I start reading into it more and everybody's like, yeah, we don't really know how. We say it resets brain activity, but what does that actually mean? And oftentimes that leaves patients and even physicians like wanting for more of an explanation. 
And so these researchers who have a very specific interest in something, in a certain type of brain activity, wanted to dig a little bit deeper. So this takes a little bit of background, but I'm going to try and keep it simple. When we look at EEG, which is a readout of brain waves, which you get by putting electrodes on the scalp. So it's, it's a non-invasive way to uh, look at brain activity. It's an electroencephalogram. It's like what I did when I had my sleep study. I had all these wires on my head all night. And it looks to see if I'm in REM sleep or like what different waves my brain is producing. So the electrical activity. When you look at an EEG, we see that there's a lot of different types of electrical activity, but we can broadly divide it into two types. We've got the brain waves that we're used to seeing, which are synchronized brain waves. They, they, they oscillate. So there's like a, a periodicity, a pattern to them. And then there's asynchronous or aperiodic activity, which historically we've always thought of as noise. And most researchers, they see that on EEG or not even researchers, clinicians, and they just kind of say, okay, uh, throw away the noise. I'm looking for the signal. And they focus on the oscillations. They focus on the reproducible kind of measurable patterns in, in brain activity and say, okay, this is obviously a delta wave or this is an alpha wave or whatever. But these researchers are actually fundamentally interested in asynchronous or um, aperiodic activity. And so what often we thought of as noise, they're saying maybe there's actually a signal there that's important. And so they started to look back at all of the historical data and they did their own studies where they looked at um, recent patients who underwent both EEG, or sorry, who underwent both ECG, electroconvulsive therapy, and something called MCG, which is magnetic convulsive therapy, or sorry, MST. Mm. What does the S stand for? Because it's, it's basically ECG. Magnetic stimulation therapy. Stimulation therapy, thank you. Um, but it still induces a convulsion. I guess they wanted to change the branding a little bit there. So no, MST. But it is a completely different thing. It's so much gentler. Yeah, it's using it magnets. It's it's a yeah. lot gentler, and it's it's um and actually that translates in a minute to their to their outcomes, which is interesting. But magnetic stimulation therapy is using magnets instead of electricity to induce smaller, basically like less severe um, seizure activity or convulsions. And so they looked at one study with MST patients, two studies with ECT patients, small sample size because there always are small sample sizes with this kind of um, this kind of intervention. And instead of looking at the oscillations, because historically everybody was connecting the oscillations to the improvement or the reduction in um, depressive symptoms following ECT, they said, let's actually look at the aperiodic activity. Let's look at the brain waves that we, we usually would just throw away as background noise. And part of the reason they did that is because nobody's really been satisfied with looking at the oscillations they find that there's no real um, relationship or no predictable, discernible relationship between a change in the oscillation patterns and a reduction in depressive symptoms. So people who are endorsing less depressive symptoms after ECT don't necessarily have higher or lower oscillations. It's kind of all over the map. So they're like, maybe there's something else going on here. So they dig into the aperiodic activity. They utilize a different approach because sometimes it's really hard to distinguish the two. So they utilize a different approach to say, okay, we're pretty confident to say this is a periodic activity, but it's not noise. It's telling us something. What is it telling us? They start looking at it and they find something interesting. A periodic activity increases by more than 40% on average following electroconvulsive therapy about 16% on average following um, magnetic stimulation therapy. And when they ran their calculations and utilized their statistical approaches, they actually found that the oscillations, the slow oscillations that are often pointed to as responsible for that change in depressive symptomatology, that they actually don't change much at all, but that most historical data was likely misidentifying a aperiodic activity as slow oscillations. They said that actually some patients after e e ECT didn't even have any slow oscita oscillations detected. So what historically was thought of was as the noise, which most researchers were just throwing out and not even looking at, they think that's where the signal is. And when they start translating that from these sort of research terms into clinical terms, they are using a very particular theory. 
And that theory is a theory of depression that's based on brain inhibition. So we know that we have in inhibitory neurotransmitters. We have specific cells that like that are GABAergic cells that induce inhibition in the brain. We also have excitatory uh, neurotransmitters. There's a long standing theory of depression that people with uh, severe depression don't have enough inhibition in their brain. The inhibitory cells aren't there or there aren't enough of them or they're not working well enough. And so because of that, you get this downstream effect where certain signals are amped up too much. They're not turned off or turned down enough. And that balance seems to be really, really important according to this theory. And there are a lot of different theories of depression. But according to this theory, that balance is really important of like inhibition to activity in order to maintain a sort of healthy behavioral response to mood. And so based on that theory, which is the theory that they're operating within to do these studies, they are positing that post-ECT changes in that a periodic activity, what we used to think of as noise, is actually changing in inhibition in the brain. So that aperiodic activity might actually be restoring that balance and improving the patient's ability to inhibit certain um, downstream like neurotransmitter effects. And because of that, that reset function that we often talk about might be real. So an ECT, or to a lower extent, or less effective, but also less um, invasive extent, uh, MST, induces seizure-like activity. That seizure-like activity, quote-unquote, resets the brain. But the way it's resetting the brain is it's increasing aperiodic brain waves, which downstream increases inhibitory neurotransmitters or in inhibitory uh, neurons, which release more inhibitor and neurotransmitter. And because of that, there's a better, basically, transmission, electrical transmission balance in the brain. So that's their theory. They're trying to test it. They're showing nibbles of improvements there. But it's going to take, obviously, a ton more research to look into it. But it's interesting to see because historically, we just don't have a good explanation of why this works. We just know it does, which for some patients just isn't enough for them to be willing to undergo the um, the procedure. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting. Yeah. And, and and I think it's really helpful. You know, the more we know, the more armed with information we are, the better we can be our own health advocates and make decisions that, that are, are healthy and good for us. And so it's nice to know that there's, at least we can see what's going on now. We can see a change. Um, but why that's happening, we're still a little unclear about. And how that feeds into a larger um, theory of depression is still, you know, it's still a pretty open question. It's, it's amazing how little that answer has moved. Like I learned about ECT mm -hmm. 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. It's an old and, treatment. And yeah, and it's older than that. But I remember when I was like in medical school learning about mm -hmm. it, the answer was, well, we don't really know. We think it resets the brain somehow. Yeah, exactly. And, was, and it's that was 30 years ago. And we're basically still there. And I had this epiphany when I was talking to my friend today where I was like, well, it resets the brain. She's like, but how? And I'm like, because it's like a seizure. And she's like, yeah, but how does that re what does that mean? And I'm like, Ugh. you don't know. <laughs> and it's like, I know, but I don't know because nobody really knows. Yeah. But now maybe we know a little better and that's kind of cool. All right, Bob, tell us about building new materials with AI and robots. Those are three of my favorite things. Yeah, right. AI robots and automating scientific research in the news this week with two related research papers that were published recently in Nature, which I, th I think will be remembered for a long time. Their titles give you an idea what, what I'll be talking about. Scaling Deep Learning for Materials Discovery and an Autonomous Laboratory for the Accelerated Synthesis of Novel Materials. That kind of says it all right there. Uh, many researchers were involved here, especially uh, Ekin Dogus Kubak, who leads the materials discovery team at Google DeepMind in London, and he was involved in both of these studies. So, so what is the latest with automating science with new materials discovery? Um, as we've said in our book and on the show many times, material science it's really one of the key drivers of technological advancement. Uh, new functional materials can give us fundamental breakthroughs across countless technologies from clean energy, information processing, batteries, photovoltaics, and even samurai swords. Right, Steve? Oh, yeah. So, yes, new classes of functional inorganic materials and even just minor tweaks to current materials could have amazing potential benefits to me 
and I suppose you guys too, and and everybody else. <laughs> Thanks, um, Bob. <laughs> the pro- the problem is that literally billions of different materials probably exist. Studies have been done to point to like, yeah, there's probably billions of these of these inorganic materials that are that are atomically different, uh, very that are distinct from each other. But only a smaller subset of them are are probably functional and actually really uh, have some utility for us. Uh, finding them, finding those functional materials is basically the, like the, a major goal of the entirety of solid state chemistry. Uh, but the process is really expensive and it's really time consuming. So automating this whole process is obviously the way to go here, right? Um, and there have been successes in the past. Like I hadn't heard about this one, the Materials Project at Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory in Berkeley, California, by computationally simulating new inorganic materials and then calculating what their properties could be, they've come up with 48,000 materials that they think will be stable, that they predict, that they calculate will be stable. So that's 48,000. Amazing. Uh, The new process, though, is like that, but on smart steroids mixed with meth. (laughs) <laughs> what, is, what does that mean? I don't know, but it sounded good. This this new process involves the creation of it's a deep learning tool called Graph Networks for Materials Exploration, and the acronym is GNOME, G N O M E. Graph Networks for Materials Exploration. So quickly again, deep learning is a type of AI that trains neural networks with data to perform tasks without explicitly programming it in. And a graph network, I haven't heard that one before, but a graph network is a type of deep learning that can infer from data that's represented by graphs. So that's kind of what we're talking about. So the researchers trained GNOME on databases of materials information, like, for example, the Materials Project at Lawrence Berkeley Lab I just mentioned. I went through that entire, the entire database of 48,000 material, four, yeah, 48,000 materials, and, and other, they went through other data sets as well. Um, the key here is that GNOME, the GNOME algorithm used active learning. Now, active learning, is, it's fascinating. It essentially selects the most informative examples in a data set, right? It goes through the data set, and it t- determines which ones have the most uh, information to teach the uh, the uh, the AI, and then then it improves it improves the algorithm a little each time, and it goes through and it does it over and over, slowly increasing uh, the 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 efficiency and the ability of the of the algorithm by using this active learning process. So, uh, using that process, Noam was able to discover over two million stable structures, uh, which then was able to add three hundred and eighty one thousand new inorganic compounds. For the materials project, three hundred eighty-one thousand. Whoa, th- that's a good gnome right there. <laughs> they brought the number from forty-eight thousand to oh yeah, just to an extra three hundred eighty-one thousand on top of that. Damn. So uh, Emil Merchant, he's the lead researcher on the study and Google's AI resident. He said at the beginning of this pipeline, we were getting about ten percent of the materials that we were looking for were actually stable, so 10%. By the end of training and by the end of these rounds of active learning, this efficiency number was all the way to 80%. So their efficiency went from 10 to 80% in, in this study that they did. Wow. And that's just the first paper. That's just the first paper. Uh, calculating, modeling, and predicting are great, obviously, but actually making these new materials, that's where the peanut butter hits the bread, Right. Kara, is that, an, is that an expression? I think so. It makes sense I think to I, me. I think I just Context made that clues. up. Yeah. What is that called? A ne- neologism? Yeah. Um, I like it. Where the peanut butter hits the bread. Okay, so where was I? Okay, so creating the new material is the obvious next step, right? You predict it. Well, let's, let's create it. That's where the autonomous A-Lab comes in. So this is a lab called A-Lab. You know, interesting name, A-Lab. This was created in Berkeley. It cost $2 million. It took 18 months to build it with state-of-the-art robotics. And so what these, what these robots would do is essentially they would mix – and they're like robot arms. They're not like bipedal robots walking around doing stuff. It's just like you know, anim- automated arms, robot arms. So they, they mix varied powdered solid ingredients and other components. They put them together. They heat them. And then they, the robots do this without human intervention. Um, but the real innovation here is, again, it's the AI. The AI is the real – achievement here because the AI directs this entire process. It's trained on 30,000 published synthesis procedures. So it memorized, it went through 
30,000 different ways to synthesize materials, to, to mix them and cook them together. And then based on that, it determines the best way to synthesize this, the new material that was predicted to be potentially um, functional and helpful for, for us. So it would pick the best recipe. So then it would analyze it. It, was, it would synthesize it, heat it up. It would analyze the result. And if there were problems with it or say like only – say it made a gram of this stuff but less than a half of it was the material that it was actually looking for, it would then go back to using active learning and it would create a better procedure, a better recipe, and it would try it again. So it would be learning over time. One guy said that this was kind of reminded him of Jap- chat GPT, of just going back and, and learning more and more and more. So the A-Lab did this for 17 days all by itself doing 21 experiments a day with a 71% success rate, making these, these predicted new materials, making them a reality, right? Chefing them up, cooking them, um, creating the recipe, making these materials. It was 71% successful. Now, humans typically, what do you think a human, if, if these robots did 21 experiments a day, what do you think humans can do a day? Five tops. These, this type of experiment, they're, they're saying a human could do typically one or two experiments wow. a day. They're yeah. doing 21 21 a day. The researchers say that the efficiency of this process boosted, boosted the efficiency by 50 to 100 times. Um, that's, that's a hell of an increase. Martin Burke is a chemist at the University of Illinois in Urbana, said these two papers together represent a very important step t- forward in our ability to predict stable materials and then transform them into physical form in the laboratory. And I think it's a powerful one-two punch which really moves the needle in that important space. So in the future, all right, what, what's going to happen in the future? I think it's going to be pretty amazing with this tech. Uh, it just seems so – there's like there's so much that could happen here. In the future, I think we'll likely see researchers that will try to have the AI be even more accurate in their prediction about the physical and the chemical properties of these new materials, right? As of right now, the AI basically says, hey – Here's 30,000 new inorganic materials that I predicted this week. These should be synthesized and tested. But the problem is that there's no automated lab that's going to be able, or labs, plural, that's going to keep up. There's just too many. We've got tens, we've got hundreds of thousands of these new predicted materials, and we do not have the labs. Even if we had a dozens of automated labs, it still would be too slow because there's, it's discovering, you know, we're discovering so many potentially new um, inorganic materials that we it's too much so we what they want to do in the future is they want the ai to say yo here's 30,000 new inorganic materials that i cr- that i predicted this week but these 10 right here these are probably going to knock your socks off i want you to mm-hmm, i want to mm-hmm. synthesize these and test these 10 first Oh, and tell Bob I said hi. Right. So like a decision tree about order of operations. Yeah. So, th- so, we, so they, what they need to do is they need to determine that they need to be able to predict the characteristics and the, and the properties of these predicted materials to such a degree that they could, say, they could, pr- they could prioritize them and say, hey, here's a whole bunch of new materials that, that probably are functional, but here's 10 of them, here's 20 of them, or even here's 50 of them. These guys you really want to look at first because they look so promising. They mm-hmm. really could be um, a real breakthrough here. So that's what they need to do because right now a robot and an AI is saying, here's, here's 300,000 new materials. That's great, but how do you prioritize that? It could still take us way too long. So that's, that's where uh, I think it needs to go. Uh, that's where they, they want to take it. If you haven't noticed, it's, I think this is pretty promising. It's very exciting. And I haven't said this in a while, but, but this automated discovery and creation process, I think it needs to have a, a shit ton of attention, uh, have money thrown at it, X prizes, Jay. Now imagine, Im- imagine, you know, with the materials discovery, there's so much that could happen that would be game changers. I, I mean, imagine photovoltaics and battery technology that's near the limit of what physics allows. You know, imagine, you know, what that could do for society. That, that's just two very, very easy examples. It's, a, it's, it's so promising, I think. I mean, basically, you're, you're automating scientific discovery. You're essentially doing, you know, do years of research in you know in a couple of weeks type of type of thing and uh, and with the material science you know don't get me going because that's that's God Jay, Steve right we've talked about it so many mm-hmm. times you come up with a new fundamental class of materials I mean that's that's a game changer right there no yeah the AI and robotic automated research is is taking off you know and again the ability to do weeks months of research in hours or days is amazing yeah uh, and we're already seeing it. All right, thanks, Bob. 
Sure, man. Uh, I'm going to do a quick item. This is by from TikTok series. So as you know, every Wednesday at one o'clock, I, I record some TikTok videos and we live stream on TikTok and on Discord. And there's a lot of interesting nonsense on TikTok. I mean, it's it's funny how each social media outlet has its own character. You know what I mean? Like yeah, Facebook own, is different than Twitter. Brand of is diff- yeah, it's different than YouTube. And I'm, get, I'm getting a feel for the brand of nonsense on TikTok. It's bad. It's like yeah, it's really, bad. it's, it's a, deep. Really, it's deep. Yeah. A- anyway, so this, this one was, was, we were flagged in this one and I re- did record a, a, a response to it. This is a video of an African self-taught, self sort of made researcher called Maxwell Chukumbuzo. And he is claiming that he has d- developed an electric car that never has to be charged. And mm. so where's the energy coming from, you might be asking, if you have any scientific literacy whatsoever. So is it coming from braking? I know that wouldn't be enough, but... No, it's not just regenerative braking, which just recovers a little bit of energy. You right. Can't, it can't be the energy that runs the car entirely. And it's not from the sun or the wind. No, it's not solar. It's not a wind-powered car. It's run by water. Not, not burning water. It's electric car. It's running off of radio frequency waves. Oh, wow. No. So, this, so this is a known technology. It's called energy harvesting. We've talked about it on the show. And you can, you can harvest teeny tiny bits of energy from the ambient radio frequencies that are all around us. Uh, and, and this technology is being developed to do things like operate remote tiny sensors, you know, for example. The, and that's, of course, the, the reason why this technology fails, you know, is because not because we can't do this. You know, the whole idea that there's energy and, you know, wireless technology and that, you know, you can convert that into electricity. This is decades old. This is nothing new. The problem is I, I did a rough back of the envelope calculation. So I may be off by an order of magnitude or whatever. But, you know, I, I said, all right, well, how much energy typically can you get from harvesting energy from electromagnetic? magnetic radiation and how much electricity is in a typical in a tesla you know in a, in a car electric mm-hmm. car battery and the difference is about one million times <laughs> you're, you're dealing yeah. with it says milli to micro watts so let's even assume milliwatts yeah. and you have kilowatt hours in a car battery so milliwatts to kilowatts is a million times right so this thing would harvest about one millionth of the energy you would actually need to like drive your car for a day. Maybe he's driving a toy car. No, the, the, the video <laughs> shows him driving an electric car, though it's only moving like at one mile an hour across the showroom floor. Like, you know what I mean? Like, he's not driving it on a road or anything. And presumably there's batteries in there. But they, the question is, you know, where would this energy be coming from? So when confronted with that, not that specifically, but just the idea of, well, isn't there just very small amounts of energy in radio frequency? He says, yes, but he invented something which magnifies the energy. Oh, my God. Mm-hmm. What does that mean? What, is that? what do you mean you magnify the energy? That's, there's, that's no such thing. It, you, you're just adding more energy? Is that what you mean? Where's that energy coming from, right? So they, that, there's no answer for that. So this is pure pseudoscience. Uh, it's pure nonsense. And is he asking for money? Yeah, well, like for yes, for investors. Yeah. And, you know, but the, it's, of course, it's all the usual conspiracy theory nonsense that then gets surrounding these claims. Because, you know, there, it's obvious pseudoscientific free energy type of nonsense, right? That just the math does not work. The physics does not work. And so what, what, how do you respond to that? So one thing he says is that, you know, we tried to get a patent for the device, but you can't, they said he couldn't get a patent because they, the patent office, this is in the United States, does not patent uh, free energy devices. That's right. They don't because they don't, they don't exist. They don't work. Mm-hmm. And, and, and they, they correctly identified your gadget as a free energy device. But then he and his supporters say, well, this is just discrimination against African inventors. It's like, oh, okay, I'm, I'm not saying that that doesn't exist or whatever. There isn't racism in the world. It's not my point. But that's not why they're rejecting you. You're rejecting you because this device can't possibly work. And it's pseudoscience no matter where you're from or what your background is. And if so, anything, all you're going to do is sadly increase discrimination yeah, by trying right. to pause it, like by basically scamming people mm-hmm. when other people who are doing legitimate work are right. vying for the same funding. Now, I don't know if this guy's a con artist or just a crank. He, he smells like a crank to me. So apparently he's self-taught, you know, 
and he's one of these guys who like taught himself engineering and everything. And so he's disconnected from reality, disconnected from the scientific community. So yeah, he, but he's he, got to be. I mean, there's got to be some charlatanism in there. Yeah. If he's got a working prototype, because that means he's faking his prototype. Yeah. Yep. No, absolutely. Yeah, like he's scamming people. And the the comments in TikTok are like ninety percent credulous. They mostly yeah. are like some version of, "Oh, you better watch you back. They're going to try to kill you to to suppress this technology," and you know that that kind of stuff. Wow. Uh, few people are saying like, "But doesn't this break the laws of physics?" And, and you're right, yeah. You know, but yeah, it's very. The responses are are very sad. Uh, a lot of scientific illiteracy going on in there. And people basically just have no idea of the physics. And so they just yeah. see the movie the movie plot, you know. In fact, there, you know, I was talking about this on TikTok also recently. The fact there was, you guys remember the movie The Formula from yeah. like 1980s? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I know, Jay, we, mm-hmm. yeah, I talked about it with you. That the idea that the Nazis developed a formula for creating art, you know, synthetic gasoline. And then the whole plot of the movie is the attempt of like oil executives to to squash this formula, you know, cause that would threaten their profits. It's like, yeah, that's complete nonsense. Like there's, cause you know, what formula could possibly exist? Like where would all the energy be coming from to create, you know, cause gasoline has a lot of energy in it and that energy is stored. You know, it's, it's a source yeah, it's of very energy, energy dense. Yeah. God, but it's yeah. all, but it's not only a storage medium, it's also a source of energy cause it's, it has the energy in the ground. You know, the crude oil has the energy in it. But um, if you have synthetic gasoline, it's like, what's the process for making it? You either have to be starting with hydrogen or some high energy molecule to begin with, or you need to be putting energy into it. And where's that energy coming from? You're going to be having, you know, multiple power plants producing the energy necessary to synthesize the artificial gas. And then, then it is just an energy storage medium. And it is zero threat to um, the oil industry. It's just not playing in the same space. But anyway, you know, just people fail to ask that question, that basic question, whenever you're confronted with anything like this, is where is the energy coming from? And if you just think mm. through that question, it, yep. it washes away a lot of pseudoscience. Because the, the, there's no free lunch, right, when it comes to physics. The energy has to come from somewhere. Of course. Yeah. You say, of course, but that's like the big hole in a lot of these pseudoscientific claims is that they're not thinking about that very right. basic thing. Oh, we're just, I have a device which amplifies the energy. Well, what does that mean? It amplifies the energy. And Steve, don't remember, you also got to kind of know energy can be neither created nor destroyed, right? I mean, it just transfers from one yes. type of energy to another with a little bit, with some loss in heat that's, you know, yep. kind of inevitable. That's kind of the way the universe works. So right, but it doesn't come out of thin air. Right. That's why that's where zero point energy comes from, which he's not going mm-hmm. there, but maybe he will eventually. Who knows? But where it's like, oh, the energy's there, it's just in the in the you know the quantum foam of the universe. Eh, oh that no! Yeah. Well, in a way, it's it's like a different iteration of that. It's basically yeah. saying the energy is there in the form of waves, which is true, just but only a millionth of what you're talking yeah. about. Yeah. <laughs> well, everyone, we're going to take a quick break from our show to talk about a new sponsor this week, Listening.com. Guys, Listening.com is an app that turns academic papers and textbooks and PDFs, websites, and emails into audio so you can listen to them on the go, which is really convenient. Ugh, I cannot tell you how life-changing this would have been early on in working on my dissertation. I have long used inferior products to this, different apps and um, websites that can read written text, but none of them are able to skip citations. None of them are able to skip tables to actually pronounce these difficult words. And lots of times when you're on the go, you're driving, you're in the bus, you're you know on your bike and you need to bone up, you need to learn about something. It's really hard when you're trying to decipher what the AI is trying to tell you. Listening.com solves all of those problems. And as a listener to the SGU, I know sometimes you guys want to read these technical papers, and this is a great way to do it to make them more accessible. Best of all, if you use the link listening.com slash SGU, you'll be able to get your first three weeks for free. That's an extra free week. So go ahead, give it a try. Go to listening.com slash SGU. All right, guys, let's get back to the show. All right, Jay, it's Who's That Noisy time. All right, guys, last week I played This Noisy. (laughs) 
Might be one of the weirdest who's that noisy. That's a I've weird heard. noise. I, yeah. If I had to guess, I would guess that it's a critter. Bob and Kara, what do you guys think? No idea. I'm th- yeah, I'm thinking critter now, too. Ed Falcone writes in, this week's one is easy. It's the id monster from Forbidden Planet. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. <laughs> That's <laughs> it. You. You're so funny. I thought. That's I it. Know, he totally. That's you know, funny. I love that movie, and I always wanted it. You know, the the monster does make it this, you know, huge roar and everything we do get to hear it it is it, it isn't that you're not right but i thought that was funny thank well, you well but it's that it's the technology that noise from the krell that that made that blooping bl- noise yeah i think that's what he was talking about yeah like the machine yeah the machine yeah. right darcy stevens writes in and says hey bob j long time listener first time guesser hey, bob j contacting you from Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. We just had our first November without snow in almost 100 years. Whoa. 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 Yep. More to come. For this week's Noisy, I think it sounds a lot like hydrogen or oxygen gas in a glass tube or jar being burnt. The flame travels Ah. up the tube and makes the thumb sound when it hits the opening at the end. This was a good guess. It's not correct, but there are some similar sounds in there. I've heard that, and it's a cool sound. But thank you for trying. Listener named Keely Hill wrote in and said, Hi, Jay, I think it's a plastic hand pump being used to fill a very large balloon. The click after each pump reminds me of those cheap balloon animal pumps. But hey, maybe it's a mammal. Um, (laughs) You are not correct. Is it a mammal? Well, let's just be a little more patient. We're going to get there. (laughs) You just said they weren't correct. All right, this is a close guess. Not all the way there. Kyle Ledbetter. He says, hey, Jay, I think the noisy this week is the booming of some sort of male grouse. Love you folks and the show. Happy holidays. Okay, we've taken a step in the correct direction. Mm -hmm. So let me read the winner. Carl Berg said, hi, this week's noisy is clearly a great bittern, a fairly common bird, sadly declining in Sweden, and its song can be heard around many of the thousands of lakes here. The deepest parts of the song travels very long and can be pretty spooky. My neighbors were, were terrified by the sound before they knew what it is. So <laughs> it was a critter. Yeah. Yeah. So the bird. person, uh, Andrew Furmore, who wrote in said uh, the bird, it's the Eurasian bittern. It's making a comeback, he says, in the UK. It's it's mentioned and it's known as one, the UK's loudest bird, which I find to be interesting. But it's cool. It has a trombone kind of noise. This, guys, is a bird. Check it out. Listen to this again now. <laughs> right? It's totally weird, right? Just found that, that very interesting, very funny sound. Just sounds really silly, you yeah. know? Um, so anyway, so thank you guys for your guesses. Okay, guys, this noisy was sent in by a listener named Fred Sandoval. If you guys think you know what this week's noisy is or you heard something cool, you can email me, you can email me, email me, email me at WTN at the skeptics org. Steve, not much to announce here. We have a couple of events coming up. One of them is, um, so we're going to Dallas, Texas, and we will be doing an extravaganza and we will be doing an SGU private show. This is all happening in April, April 6th and 7th. You can go to theskepticsguide.org to to uh, see the link there to get the information on the dates and the locations and everything. So if you're interested, please join us. A lot of people have been uh, have been signing up. It's really exciting. We're really excited to do these shows. I, can't, I actually can't wait to do the extravaganza again. Yeah, it'll be a lot of fun. And guys, you know, 2023 is coming to an end. If you are a regular listener of this show and you appreciate the work that we do, we would really appreciate you giving us some support. You can become a patron by going to patreon.com forward slash skeptics guide. 
you know, our patrons really are what keep the lights on for us. And we have a wonderful community. Got to meet so many patrons of ours at Nauticon, which we did in November. So yeah, you know, we have we have a ton of awesome people that you could become friends with and, you know, chat with on a daily basis on our Discord. And on top of that, you could be supporting something that you believe in. So if you if you feel like we've we've moved the needle at all, please do consider becoming a patron. All right. Thanks, Jay. All right, guys, let's go on with science or fiction. It's time for science or fiction. Each week, I come up with three science news items, two real and one fake, and I challenge my panelist skeptics to tell me which one is the fake. Got three regular news items. You guys ready? Yep. Mm -hmm. All right, item number one, a new study finds that the average volume of speech, called sonority, is highest in the tropics and lowest in the northwest coast of North America. All right, number two, a new comparative study finds that human newborn brain size is relatively smaller at birth than our primate relatives, representing a relatively shorter gestation and delay in brain development. And our number three, researchers find that the electric organ discharge of an electric eel is capable of transferring DNA into zebrafish larva. Kara, go first. The one that I'm most credulous about off the top is the electric eel. I don't know why, but if an eel, I think they make contact. I think they have to like close the circuit somehow to so, like make contact with whatever it is that gets kind of that that zap and maybe that organ is releasing some sort of special cells that you know obviously have dna and it just says it's capable of doing it it doesn't say it always does it and specifically into larva so i guess if it's shocking zebrafish larva specifically that it could transfer some some DNA into it. I mean, we see, I feel like we see horizontal transfer all the time with bacteria and stuff. So I don't know, that one just doesn't bother me that much. So really it's between the sonority one and the comparative study. Okay. So a new comparative study says that a human newborn brain size is relatively smaller at birth than primate relatives. So, so relative. Yeah. So they, I, they have to explain the relative, rel, relative. I can only put so much information in one sentence. It's mm -hmm. relative to, developmental stage right so right right it, it's, it's in other words it's basically saying that human babies are at a, a earlier developmental stage relatively when they're born than our primate relatives with respect to brain development like the brain is smaller and less developed at birth than compared to the the full range of development in humans compared to our primate relatives yeah, that's interesting because I think about looking at humans by themselves and you think about like the bobblehead phenomenon, right? How human babies have like huge heads compared to their bodies and they can't even like touch their fingers up above their head. I was watching um, The Boy Who Harnessed the Wind last night, which is a phenomenal film, by the way, if you haven't seen it. And the dad in the film was saying, you know, uh, our village elders like didn't ever didn't always record our our actual ages when we were born. So we didn't know when we were old enough to go to school. And so one of the tests we would do is if you could reach your hand over your head and touch your ear, you were old enough to go to school. Because like little kids heads are really big. <laughs> and so there's something about that when you just look at humans, but maybe, you know, primate heads are even bigger. <laughs> and so that one is like, I don't know. And then this idea of sonority. So the average volume of speech, you're saying like across, if you're yelling, if you're whispering, whatever, but the average loudness at which people speak is higher in the tropics and lower in the Northwest coast of North America. I have no idea why that would be the case. I think we still have a pretty decent gestation as, as human beings. Nine months is a long time, but there is probably a delay. You're saying representing a delay in brain development in humans, not in other primates, right? Yeah. The way it's worded. Okay. It does take us quite a while to wean, and it takes us quite a while to grow up. So that part is what you probably put in intentionally to make me more credulous. Ooh, I got to put my penny down, my nickel down on this one. I think I'll say that the fiction is the sonority one, although I'm 50-50 about it. Okay, Jay. I think the sonority one is science, 
not because I'm like, you know, remembering any firsthand interaction. Uh, and I find this fascinating, you know, the, the idea that, um, you know, culturally we, we speak at different volumes. Um, when I first read it, I read Northeast, not Northwest. And I'm like, we speak very loud over here. Um, <laughs> right. You know, New York, forget about it. You know, 68th street, you know, whatever the, uh, I'm thinking that that one is science. The second one here about the human newborn brain size being relatively smaller at birth than our primate relatives. Like I can't, I can't think of any reason why that would be. I don't know. I just don't think that that one is science. And the third one, researchers find that electric organ discharge of an electric eel is capable of transferring DNA into zebrafish larvae. I mean, that's kind of crazy, isn't it? I mean, is that that seems strange, very strange to me. Not not out of the realm of possibility, but just a very weird thing happening there, right? Steve, what, can you say anything else about that? No. Are you basically saying that they make the sound and the sound that they make is actually transferring DNA into larvae? It's to not larvae. a sound. It's an electric discharge. It's electricity. It's electricity. Mm-hmm. Man, that sounds pretty serious. Uh, but the, but Kara didn't pick that one, and that one seems so weird to me. That doesn't mean anything. You know when we go first, we suck. I know, but I just trust you, Kara. You know, no, don't do that. <laughs> no, I don't know. Idea. I just, there's something about the, the human thing. I don't think the second one here, the human, the newborn brain size one, I think that one's a fiction. Okay, Bob. The sonority one, my first thought was, could it be um, air density um, at those at those locations? Potentially, I don't know. The uh, let's jump to the electric organ discharge. Yeah, I mean, I, I remember a technique called electrophoresis, which basically organizes like DNA and RNA using an electric charge. So that makes me think this could be feasible. So um, I'm gonna. I know that I have read in the past that hu- human babies have the highest brain to body weight ratio of anything alive. Um, I don't know if that's absolutely 100% true now, but I specifically remember reading that. And, you know, rel- you know, relative to their size, babies have huge brains. And But on the other hand, they are, you know, relatively immature because, you know, they, they wean for a long time and they can't get too much bigger. Otherwise, you know, human hips, uh, you know, will will be an impediment and they won't be able to get out. Um, so there's all that floating around, but uh, but I'll say that one the brain the, the brain size is fiction anyway. Okay, so you all agree on the third one. So we'll start there. Researchers find that the electric organ discharge of an electric eel is capable of transferring DNA into zebrafish larvae. You all agree that that one is science, and that one is science. That one is science. Yay! That was the one I thought I was going to get you guys on. Hmm. Um, Why? Because it's it's weird. You it's know? weird. Yeah. Yeah. But I, but I almost said no until I remembered about electrophoresis. Yeah, and not and that's I think probably somewhat related to it, but more yeah. directly related. And why would they have even studied this? Is because we use electricity in order to do genetic engineering. This is how we get cells to take up DNA. So they said, ah, oh, I wonder if electric eels have the same effect. So, and the reason why it's zebrafish larvae, because that's the study, right? So this was, they didn't show that this is happening in the wild. They were testing their hypothesis in the lab to see if this is, could even theoretically happen. So they used, they used zebrafish larvae and they had uh, fluorescent genes in the water. And the, they had, like, some tanks got shocked and other tanks didn't get shocked. And the ones that did get shocked incorporated the, the bioluminescence genes in them. And the ones that didn't get shocked didn't. So uh, it actually did have an effect on the uptake of these genes you know, by the zebrafish larva. So that means this is something that could potentially happen in the wild, but that wasn't the study, right? So that, that, that will be the next step to see if it's actually happening. That's why I had to say that is capable of transferring DNA, not that it's actually happening. All right, should we go to one or two? What do you mm. think? No one. idea. Which one did I pick? Sonority? Yeah. All right, Jay said one. And that you guys picked the brain. A new study finds that average volume of speech called sonority is highest in the tropics and lowest in the northwest coast of North America. Kara, you think this one is the fiction. Bob and Jay, you think this one is science. The interesting question here for me is, is there a, is that a variable that varies 
by culture or by language, right? And if so, what is the pattern? What is it varying with, right? Is and that if it was more... by culture, by language, why would it vary so much within a culture? So this is what they find. Yeah, but is there a an average, right? So the average. Mm. Oh, so right, obviously, there's right. going to be yeah, a lot average. of there's going to be a lot of variability on the individual level. Um, and we all know loud talkers, right? But of course, <laughs> this one is science. This is science. Yeah, baby. Now, what they found mm. was that it varies by language groups, mm -hmm. but there's there's some variability in individual languages. And how they interpret that is that evolutionarily, I mean culturally evolutionarily, th it takes a long time for this feature to become solidified within within a, a group, right? So you only it only correlates with basal languages, not like more recently diverged languages don't necessarily correlate with each other. So there is some variability within a language group, but the language group has a, either a your is pretty consistent overall in its average volume. But as it's one of those things that you don't think is varying culturally, right? Like you wouldn't notice it until you went to a different culture that had a different sonority, had a different average volume. It's like, yeah. why is everybody shouting at me? Or why is everybody whispering? So I thought that was interesting. All of this means that a new comparative study finds that human newborn brain size is relatively smaller at birth then our primate relatives representing a relatively shorter gestation and delay in brain development is the fiction. But this also, I thought, might have been a, a gotcha one because this is what people, you know, prior to this study, this was conventional wisdom, not because there was data showing it, but because it makes sense. So again, I tried to clarify, I know this is a little complicated, but it's relative to their developmental potential, right? So in other words, that when, when humans are born, their heads are their brains are not as far along their developmental pathway as mm -hmm. say a chimpanzee or a gorilla uh, baby is that was the and the and bob you hit upon the reason the reason was you think well because our brains are absolutely so big right and mm -hmm. you know pelvises only get so big we had to you know speed up uh, that makes sense. Our gestation. Yeah. We had to like shorten the gestation and, and basically slow down brain development up until birth and then have a spurt of brain development after birth. Because you know, we've got to get this head through the pelvis, right? Yeah. And so that was, that's what they were expecting and that's the conventional wisdom. But what they found was that, in fact, that's not true. That, that human babies are just as developed as primate babies in terms of their relative brain development, you know, their de developmental stage neurologically. In fact, maybe even a little advanced. So it, we essentially, we, get, we, we do get born relatively a little bit earlier, like a shorter gestation, but, uh, but our neural development is still on track and it's not relatively earlier in our developmental stage at birth than our primate relatives. I think I also like sometimes these get me because I remember learning a long time ago and I was just trying to look into it now as you were talking. Brain to body weight is not a good indicator of much. Like we're up there on the scale, but we're not like the biggest. Like well, I'm pretty sure like well, the brain to body it, ratio is sort of not a good predictor. So it's so that you're we're high. Right. Ish. You have to use elephants are higher, whales are higher, hippopotamuses are higher. You have to, you can't just use um, just brain size to body size, and the right. reason is that that is not linear along different sizes, like the mouse to elephant scale or the mouse to whale scale. You can't yeah. use that because bigger bodies need bigger brains because you need all of that surface area to control the bigger body. Right. And then there's also just like weird uh, flukes of evolution, like chihuahuas have a super weird brain to body size. Ratio. Yeah. And, or, or like dolphins have a bigger brain. And but that's because they have a lot of white matter to process yeah. all of their sonar. Um, right. So there's something called an encephalization quotient, mm -hmm. which basically you there's a curve. Again, the sort of the mouse to whale curve relating average brain size to body size. For mammals, it's only like it's only relevant for mammals, and then you could say, are you above or below the curve for mammals of your size? Right? You you basically take your body size and where does it intersect the curve, and is your brain size above or below the curve for your size? That's right. the encephalization quotient that does track. 
not just raw brain size to body size because that doesn't it's not linear and i think that's sort of what i was thinking about when i was thinking about the relative size compared to primates yeah but what what this is getting at is just developmentally are we born in a in a more in a more undeveloped state Right, you know, than our, than right. And the answer is, neurologically speaking, and the answer is no, even though they right. thought even maybe though we it, thought, we, we we would thought be, maybe we yeah. would be in order to get the head through the pelvis, but it turns out that's not the case. Right. Interesting. And remember, there's also neuronal density, which is not yeah, yeah, just yeah, brain right. size. It's the neurons yeah. per, per unit of volume of brain. And so you have to not only look at the encephalization quotient, you have to also look at neuronal density. Humans, of course, have a massive neuronal density. Yeah. Um, and we have a massive. We are we are the most encephalized species, um, even though we don't have the largest brain to body weight. Because again, that that's not a linear thing. Um, right. Steve, was it raccoons that had uh, raccoons are very high. Bears are high. Dogs density? are high. Yeah, raccoons have a very high in, a neuronal density. Cats are very low. They're like average for mammals. But um, yeah, so the so an, so animals, you know, mammals that have high socialization. That seems to be really the biggest yeah. thing driving mm -hmm. brain yeah. power and neuronal density is socializing takes a lot of brain power. There's a lot of variables you got to think about and you have to calculate and be sensitive to and perceive and everything. And so, and dogs got that way because they basically socialize to humans, as we were saying earlier in the show. Um, whereas cats are kind of aloof and they don't, and they have the neuronal density to go with it. All right, well, good job, guys. Thank you, Steve. Yes. Evan is not here, so I have a quote. This quote comes from Carol Wade, who is a cognitive psychologist. Uh, she's co-author with Carol Tavris on a couple of books on psychology. And Carol Wade wrote, People can be extremely intelligent, have taken a critical thinking course, and know logic inside and out, yet they may just become clever debaters, not critical thinkers, because they are unwilling to look at their own biases. Oh. Yeah, I like that quote. We talk about this all the time. When people first learn like critical thinking, skeptical chops, they use it as a weapon against other others, mm -hmm. not as a way of examining their own thinking, beliefs, and arguments. And you really mm -hmm. need to turn that light inward. That's the most important thing. So I completely agree with this quote. I think it's great. They fall victim to that. What is that bias where it's like, when good things happen, it's because of something we did. And when bad things happen, it's because yeah. of something somebody else, like it happened to us. That's the fundamental attribution error. Yes. It's it's like, it's sort of like a flavor of the fundamental attribution error. It's like we first learn this stuff and then we just apply it to everybody else. Yes, exactly. Well, it was funny. I was looking, I saw the quote. I'm like, oh, who was Carol Wade? So I put her name. When you put Carol Wade into Google with no qualifiers, the first thing you come up with is, Carol Wade is an actress known for Team Knight Rider from 1997. So Whoa. I'm like, oh, cool. And it's one of those actresses turned, you know, mm -hmm. academic or whatever. Like, nope, that was the wrong Carol Wade. Oh. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's Carol Wade, the cognitive psychologist, which makes a lot more sense. A lot more sense. Yeah, yeah. that's true. <laughs> All right. Hey, guys, I want to point out that uh, the show we're recording in two weeks, uh, and it will be the show that's coming up at the, the last show of the of the calendar year, is our year in review show. Always a lot of fun. Again? Uh, Ian will be joining us for that show. <laughs> but what we need from you, the listener, is you need to email us at info at the, the skeptics .org, org. Email us all of your fondest memories of SGU over 2023. So we want you to tell us what was your favorite news item uh, or science news of the year, best SGU segment, best interview, funniest moment, skeptical hero of the year, skeptical jackass of the year. And if um, there's any, any skeptic or scientist or thinker or philosopher or whatever who died in 2023 that you want to get mentioned in the, uh, in memoriam, send me that, Send me that information as well. We'll add them to the list. Um, this show is always a lot of fun. We're looking forward to it, but it, it's better the more information you send us. Yes, please um, remind us because I'm getting old and I don't remember this year. <laughs> <laughs> I always have to look back over the episodes and like, remind myself of all the stuff we talked about and all the interviews we did. All right. Well, thank you guys again for joining me this week. Sure, thank man. you. Thanks, Steve. And until next week, this is your Skeptic's Guide to the Universe. <laughs> Skeptic's Guide to the Universe is produced by SGU Productions. 
dedicated to promoting science and critical thinking. For more information, visit us at theskepticsguide.org. Send your questions to info at theskepticsguide.org. And if you would like to support the show and all the work that we do, go to patreon.com slash skepticsguide and consider becoming a patron and becoming part of the SGU community. Our listeners and supporters are what make SGU possible.